Hi, good morning. So, who of you are coders and how many of you are designers? Can we get an idea? Developers? Okay. Designers? Okay, that's awesome. So, today we're going to talk about using the Joomla framework for something different, something radically different. So, typically you have used Joomla for building websites, even decently large web applications maybe, but that was the Joomla CMS. So today we are going to show you how the Joomla framework can be used in a very different way. So what we have done is that we have built a LCMS with the Joomla framework. So I'll come to that. So I'm Parth Lavate. I'm uh, the strategic marketing manager for the Joomla team right now. And besides that, my day job is basically I'm CEO of Tech Joomla and TakeD Web Solutions. And we are into web applications, mobile applications, and a lot of that. So that's TakeD Web. We do all that. and. Uh, under Tech Joomla, which you might have heard of, we do a lot of Joomla extension development, and we have quite a few popular e-commerce extensions that are uh, used by the community. So LCMS, what is this LCMS thing? So have our worst fears been realized? Has the framework been used to create competition, one more CMS against the Joomla CMS? Yeah, so what's LCMS? And do you actually build websites with it? Well, not so much websites. So basically, LCMS is a lighting control management system. So if you have heard about Nest, that got acquired by Google recently. So they're into home automation and stuff like that, right? So here we want to see probably not home automation, but more of industrial lighting automation using the Joomla framework as one of the pieces of the puzzle. So let's see what a LCMS does. So basically, in lighting, you have lots of devices. Let's say this resort, for example, will have thousands and thousands of lights which they're using. So that's device management for you. Then you need to group the devices together depending on how they're used. Then you have scheduling that needs to be done. So you might not need to turn off the lights based on some time schedule. You might have to do manufacturer management since you might not be procuring the actual lighting devices from a single manufacturer. So you have to manage devices, warranties, and whatnot. You also have to do user management. So for example, uh, there is a uh, huge building, let's say 70 to 100 floors, and each floor has its own janitor who manages the floor on his own. So you might have to do some kind of user management to define who can get access to what kind of uh, controls. Then you also have reports and analytics to see how much energy you're consuming probably and what you can do to reduce that consumption. So why are they used? So A, control and automation. So you'll also see that there are some devices that are automatic. So you might have uh, you know, presence-based sensors in the mix, or you might have light sensors in the mix, which actually turn on lighting when it is required. At the same time, you have some kind of time-based scheduling, and all that together lets you do control plus automation. You can do intelligent scheduling based on different schedules. Obviously, all this is done to maximize the savings that you will get out of saving energy. And uh, a lot of uh, environment standards are coming into picture where uh, different types of energy and building standards are there. So to comply with that, this kind of a system can help you. So where are they used? So typically, to justify the cost of investing in a light management system, still it still needs to be justified. It's not very cheap. But uh, university campuses, hotels, industries, where you have a large volume of lighting, uh, street lighting, any situation where the volume is large, uh, there it can definitely be justified over a decent period of time. In home and you know smaller situations, you could probably do a piece of this at a decent cost without you know getting a huge bill for it. But if you're talking volumes, then it obviously gives you returns uh, much faster. So that's the question. What, a, what is a web and mobile company doing in such a, such a situation? How, how, are, how do we fit in? So the key for us to get into this area was to use what we knew, new, you know, use our own expertise in what we were doing, which was web applications and mobile applications in new areas. So, so that's how uh, Tech Ventures was born. So Venture Partners is a company in the US that we have tied up with, which is into hardware and embedded software development. And we come in and uh, build the front end UIs for these embedded devices. So the key basically is to bring bring hardware and software together to build something that is cool. And we are basically trying to do make hardware integrations easier by bringing out the complicated embedded side coding out as web services so that the more complex stuff can be done 
uh, on the PHP side or basically outside the actual device. <coughs> so less of embedded programming and more of web, which means that web developers can actually get into this picture. So a little background. Uh, so this project was specifically done for Autic Lighting Control. So this is a California-based company which is into light manufacturing and they also do LED, man uh, uh, LED driver manufacturing. And basically they had proprietary hardware as well as proprietary software for controlling their, uh, so they basically they sold it with their lighting devices. So before I go ahead, am I speaking too fast? Because I have a tendency to do that and <laughs> I kind of lose myself while I do that. So, so the idea was to replace the open, uh, uh, the proprietary hardware and the proprietary software with open hardware and open software. And that's how we actually got involved. So what were the challenges? So the challenges are in this kind of a situation that you're controlling thousands and thousands of devices. So have you heard of something called as the Internet of Things? Right, so what is the Internet of Things? What do you think? Anybody? What do you think it does? Right. Right. So, th what when you say the Internet of Things, basically you're talking about thousands and not thousands, really millions and millions of network devices, which are intelligent to an extent and can do some things on their own, and they can be controlled remotely, and they can work with each other basically to achieve some kind of a thing. So, you have to control lots and lots of devices in this kind of a situation. It has to support multiple protocols and formats. Now, where I'm coming from here is that devices are manufactured by a large variety of players. The amount of standardization there is not that much as compared to what is there in the internet of humans, so to say. So there is a lot of different protocols that have uh, come up. Uh, so this is not something new. People have been doing this for a while. But they have been doing it with closed proprietary formats. And now you're in a situation where you have lots and lots of formats available, and you have to come up with a system that can play well with each of them. So you have to support multiple transport systems as well as multiple protocols. Uh, you have to support new devices, new smart devices as, as well as retrofits. So you might have somebody come and say that, you know, in my building, I don't have a smart device. So you cannot say to them that, hey, no, that doesn't work then. You'll have to change your device completely. So basically retrofitting should be possible. You should be able to use the existing devices. And one of the mo main important things in the Internet of Things is that you have to have an extremely light footprint. You cannot have something really huge that is resource intensive running on embedded devices. Because these things are, you know, they have very limited uh, processing power and very limited uh, RAM, so to say. So you have to have something that's extremely light. And it should be able to scale as needed, as required. <coughs> so this is a simplified representation of how uh, we have implemented this. So what you see on th this side is all the devices. So right now it's just lighting, but uh, really speaking, the concept can be scaled to any kind of a device. It just depends, it, what varies is what you can control. With lights, it's very simple. You can switch it on, you can switch it off, and you can dim it. So you can dim it at 10%, 15%, 25%, whatever. So there are only three uh, controls, so to say. Now, what you see below that is a gateway. So if there are one million lights here, basically each gateway has a limitation as to how many it can control. So I can just horizontally scale the number of gateways required, depending on how many lights I want to control. What you see before that is the application server and web services, and that's where we are using the Joomla framework. So the piece that you see, the third piece from this side and the second one from the other side, is basically built using the Joomla framework. And on this side, you have the HTML5 based browser UI. So it works completely off web services. Joomla is not writing any HTML directly. It's only outputting REST web services. And now that web services are available, I can also build a mobile application on it, right, without having to redo uh, any of the code, because the web service is already existing. So are you with me so far? Is uh, Are you able to visualize what's going on? Because I was kind of you know confused as to what would be the best way to present this. But just imagine that there are lights in here. This is, let's say, the application server, the laptop itself. And there is some kind of a gateway in between that is used as a uh, means to control the lights, right? So these are the three pieces. There was no real reason, frankly. We wanted to use something, and uh, the Joomla framework was available. We knew how to code in the Joomla framework. And that's one of the reasons the framework was born, right? 
So I'm an extension developer. I could learn, let's say, Zen, or I could just use the Joomla framework because I definitely didn't want to use the CMS for this because there was too much of a stack which was not useful. So this is a very excellent case, and that's the reason we actually chose to present this, is that it's a very, the, the very reason why the framework was born, that so that extension developers can use their same knowledge in different areas without having to learn one more different framework. So this could have been done on Yi or Slim, or you know you could do, do it on anything. It's not a huge application. But it was just easier to do it in Joomla. That's the only reason. <coughs> so this is the base architecture, so to say. So what you see, the triangles that you see on the top there, they are the actual devices. So right now it's lights, but it could be air conditioning units, motors, whatever. And this green, uh, the green box that you see, that's a Raspberry Pi. So right now we are using Raspberry Pis uh, for each gateway. So think of it as an internet router in your uh, house. You switch it on, you connect it to the network, and everybody gets Wi-Fi. And think of it like that, and let's assume that all the devices in the network are also connected to the Wi-Fi. And now, using an interface on the router, you can actually control those devices. Now that's a very overly simplified thing probably, but when it's just one house, but if you are controlling 120 different houses, right? what would you do then? So then you would basically replicate the gateways to scale to as many devices as you want. So from a technology perspective, what we have inside the Pi is the standard uh, OS that comes with the Pi, but we have Python code written on top of it that can be used as a, so basically that's what does all the intelligent stuff. Uh, so you'll see that there are three pieces. There is the device subnet, there is a control, and there is a database. So the reason for having all these things in the gateway is that even if we don't control it through the cloud-based server, it can still work on its own. So once we give it a certain amount of instructions, it can follow them. It can. Uh, so let's say I want to schedule these lights to switch on at 9 a.m. in the morning and switch off at 5 p.m. Then what will happen is that though you will use the cloud-based server to control it, and that will happen through the HTML5 interface, that device will remember it till you give a different instruction. So basically, each gateway is self-reliant. Uh, it doesn't need to have the server. If it has it, then they can work in collaboration. But otherwise, it can work by itself. So on the others up there, you'll see that this protocol for communication is basically the format is JSON. So everybody knows what JSON is, right? So if you don't, we can, I'll quickly give you an example. So basically, uh, web services are a way for machines to communicate with each other, to keep it really simple. But if you show it to a human, it's, it's going to see a lot of uh, not very well formatted for human consumption. But for it's well formatted for machine consumption. They can easily understand it. So JSON is the format. And the actual protocol differs a lot. So we have Powerline, Wireless, Zigbee, Bluetooth. And the way it is done is that we can easily extend it to any kind of protocol. So what is power line? So power line is basically a way in which you can actually communicate through the power line that is coming in. So you plug the device in, and if it is basically power line compliant, then you don't need one more wire or one more you know, wireless port or something to tell it to switch on or off. It can happen over the power line itself. <coughs> so that's power line. Wireless obviously means that each smart device has its own uh, wireless adapter. And through that, it is communicating. Bluetooth, you know, of course. Zigbee is one more protocol like that. So what we have inside Raspberry Pi is, as I said, Python. Now, how is the Raspberry Pi based device communicating with the cloud hosted web servers? And right now, we also have Raspberry Pis for the cloud hosted web servers as well. So you could put this anywhere. I mean, you could put it on a side ground host for, I mean, it could go anywhere as far as this application is concerned. <coughs> so this is a standard LAMP stack. And the LCMS backend based on the Joomla framework is what basically provides the web services. <coughs> and that exposes further web services, which are consumed by the uh, application, so to say. So once I show you a few screens and stuff, probably it's going to relate better. So that's the blue box. The Joomla framework is being used as a cloud-based server that communicates with the various gateways that are connected to it. The green box, as I said, that's the Raspberry Pi. That's strictly a Raspberry Pi right now, but it could, again, replace it with any kind of ARM-based uh, system to make it cheaper, uh, because Raspberry Pis are a fixed cost. They don't really go cheap by volume, but with custom-built ARM devices, that's possible. 
So as I was saying, you could have multiple gateways. So if you have lots and lots of devices, one gateway is not going to get be enough. You might need more, and that might be for physical reasons as well. Let's say you are controlling this whole compound, and just to increase the reach, like you would have a wireless extender. So the gateways can also act as an extender. The distance is probably too much. So you would extend it with the gateway. So the framework application itself. So I don't know if there are any framework devs here, but this is more from a pure framework perspective. So if you heard Brian's presentation in the morning, uh, you'll know that the framework is co consisting of various packages. And you can use packages from other frameworks as well with it. Right? So you'll see that uh, we have used the Joomla framework and we have used the XMPP, uh, so that's XMPP PHP, that's combined XMPP PHP. So this package basically allows us to do XMPP communication via PHP. So do you know what XMPP is? So you know how chat rooms work, right? So typically chat is powered by XMPP. So for example, uh, Gmail chat uh, hangouts, for example, is basically a variation of the Jabber protocol which is basically used for creating chats. So now consider that all the lights in this room are in one group chat, okay? And I type in saying that dim 60% and all the lights go dim to 60%. So that's exactly what's being used in here. We are using a chat room to control the devices, okay? And that's happening via PHP. The reason for using a chat room is that HTTP is too slow. It's not, and the communication that needs to happen in this kind of a situation is extremely fast. It's called, it's being chatty basically. So you need something that's going fast, you're getting feedback fast. So for example, I'm sending a message to uh, 10,000 devices at the same time to dim or switch on or switch off. Why HTTP that might get too heavy, and that's the reason for that side of it, we have a XMPP version that's being used. But we also do have a HTTP version, and I'll come to that. So that's what the package XMPP PHP is used for, to be able to send chats. Then Bootstrap and Twig are really uh, only useful for the web version of this, which is not so much used right now because we have a separate HTML5 application. Uh, so basically, these are, again, external packages, not in the Joomla framework that have been combined with the Joomla framework to build this. So REST API is something that we've been working on for a while. We have a REST API component for the Joomla CMS as well, using which you can build uh, mobile applications or have two CMSs talk to each other. Uh, but here, uh, as I said, we couldn't use the CMS because we didn't need content management. We didn't need a lot of the things that the CMS offers. But we still needed the APIs. So what we have done is that uh, the framework application outputs a human consumable view that I said, but we don't use that right now because we wanted a completely abstracted HTML5 version that could probably sit on your own desktop and talk to through purely through the web services. Currently, we are using only web services, as I said. It's actually just a repeat of what I said. So let's see the application in action. So I'll also show you a demo where we can actually click around and see what happens. So you'll see that there is uh, there are a few menus available. So there is schedule, group, uh, users, devices, manufacturers, reports, alerts. So once you log in, depending on your access control level, you'll see this kind of a menu. So what is the cool thing? Let's say you are managing this building. And this building has like 20,000 devices, let's say. So are you going to enter each and every device manually? That'll just kill you, probably. So this is an auto-discover function. So it will basically pull the various uh, protocols and try and discover which device is available. So you'll see that there is a button up top. Somewhere here. Yeah, here it is. I don't know how to point it, but that's the, so that's the discover button. So it will basically discover the devices automatically, and it will also discover the device capabilities. So as I said, in lighting, it's pretty easy. The capabilities are going to be basically one zero, switch it on or off, or dim it to a certain extent. So let's say if it was something else, let's say it was a motor, then you would have probably speed of the motor, maybe even control the torque. So depending on what device is on that side, it can also discover the services that it supports. So this is grouping. So once the devices have been discovered, so you don't need, you didn't need to enter any device till now. You can enter it if you want to, but then it supports auto discover function. Now you can do basically grouping of the devices based on a lot of different functions and one device can belong to multiple groups. So let's say I want to group this 
So I don't know what this light was called, but let's say I want to call, you know, group these type of lights in the entire building in one group. And I want to also have them belong to this room. Then that's possible. So you can basically put them in multiple functional groups depending on what kind of a control uh, requirement you have. So you'll see there is an example for, you could do story-wise control, you could do decorative lights in a certain group. So that if there's a party, you would only switch on probably the decorative lights. <coughs> so you can do scheduling. So you can create schedules and automate completely. And schedules can be done either individually or based on a certain group. <coughs> so for example, you wouldn't want to dim the porch lights at 6 a.m., uh, turn on pop, turn them off at 9 a.m. You can override when needed. So if you want a certain device to not obey the schedule, you can actually go in and override that. You can also do device mapping. Now imagine if there is a university. It's a huge campus. You might want to physically actually see how it looks on a map. So here we have used uh, Google Maps, but uh, we basically also support OpenStreetMaps there uh, so that you can map all the devices. Uh, and make it easy to find. And you'll see that you can actually control from here as well. So if you click on a device, you can actually switch it on or off or dim it from a map. So then user management, very similar to what you do in the Joomla CMS, but here you are actually managing devices, not articles or menus. Then as I said, uh, this was what I was talking about. So it's not just XMPP on the communication between uh, the devices because there are some uh, standards like COAP, which is basically for used in a lot of cases for Internet of Things that's also used. So you can actually choose when you discover the device whether you want to use HTTP to communicate with it or you want to use XMPP. <coughs> so as I said, again, uh, you might want to also manage when you're talking about lots and lots of devices. This is very typical, I think, in IT where you're managing lots of computers, say and you want to manage the warranties and what software you want and whatever. So this is like that for you know, LED, de LED devices and who is the manufacturer, when is the warranty expiring, who do you complain to when actually a device actually expires. So this actually th also has alerts. Uh, okay, I'll come to that. So that alert basically can also warn you. You can actually program the system on not on the web level where we have done it, but on the device level. So you can actually say that this has a warranty of three years and then you'll get alerts saying that you know this is going to expire so it might all i mean there are some algorithms that are, can be used to predict the you know light going out and you could get alerts and you can basically have the system automatically send an email to the manufacturer to request the replacement so all that is possible because see once the data is in you could do whatever with it and that's not actually part of the system that's just an idea that uh, you could actually implement so this is the before and after. The earlier system was built by Billion. You might have seen routers and router software done by them. And this was a Windows-based, uh, there was no nothing cross-platform about it. It was a Windows-based EXE file, single system. And that's now one on the web, uses Joomla. And that's a before and after pick of one of the screens. So this has also helped us improve the Joomla framework in a lot of ways. So we have been doing uh, so a lot of stuff on the framework just to see what it can do. And one of the things that we discovered is that there is no good uh, CRUD example where you can have an example where add, edit, list, and you know all the standard stuff that you want to do uh, is represented. So we have created an example which uh, is, pa is, is, you can find it on this URL, that you can use to start creating your own framework applications. Uh, then one more important thing is that the router that simplifies REST URLs. So with web services, what's important is that uh, the URLs are self-explanatory. So if you read the REST URL, you should be able to make sense out of it. So it, it's like api.com slash device name slash on, or api.com slash device name slash dim slash 60, which means you know this device dim to 60. So that router, the same thing that goes with Joomla URLs, right? The link that you see when you go to an article, if it's self-explanatory, if it's human-friendly, that's SEF for you. But this is SEF so that the API is self-explanatory. So there's a router that's written which is specific uh, to the framework. And this is a term glossary for you in case you didn't really get any of the words. So API is basically application pro uh, programming interface. 
LCMS is not a content management system, it's a lighting control management system, so nothing to worry about. The Joomla CMS is not going anywhere. XMPP is basically a messaging protocol and is ex used extensively in communications, mainly for chat, as I said. Uh, RPI is Raspberry Pi. COAP is basically constrained uh, application protocol, which is used for uh, basically simple electronic devices for chatty type of communication. So that's actually the last slide. And now the session is open for questions. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, so I'll I think go back to the screen for you so that we can see all the pieces. Well, the same things that would prevent Joomla from being hijacked, so to say. So actually, again, as you said, there's different layers here. So what's happening here is that uh, this network that you see is basically a LAN network, right? So basically, I have a router here. So let's say this is the Netgear router. And it's only controlling what's in the LAN. And it's exposed to the internet through the connection to the web server. So typically, what we have here is that there are, have you heard about SSH public-private keys? So that only the machines that have the key can communicate with it. So right now that's what we're using, so that you can't have anybody come and start doing it. And here we don't, uh, so here also that is the same, but right now what we have is that the HTML5 browser UI is sitting on the same machine as the uh, API. But we could potentially put it anywhere else. So if we were to do that, then we would basically put a, uh, something like a Facebook Connect, which is a OAuth based authentication layer. And that's completely possible. So at this point, the points of entry are basically this gateway, which is which you could potentially connect to and try to get in. So that has a public key, private key kind of a security. And this is authentication based, so it's a web application at this end. So the same things that you would do for a Joomla application to secure it, the same things you would do on this end. <coughs> Any other questions? Pardon me? Uh, it's not part of the Joomla framework right now, but the web services, how to build the web services, that has been contributed back. You can also actually do web services right now with the framework, but uh, with what we have done, basically the web services become prettier to look at. And the example application is something that is contributed back as of now. So there is two parts of this development, one that we have contributed back, which can be used. And potentially we are working with the company that we have done it for to see what parts of that can also be contributed back. So, so the main web service engine and all the scheduling and stuff is kind of not so open yet. Hopefully if they agree, we can also open it up. So it's going to be their call because we did it for them. But the things that were kind of standard with web services and whatever was not proprietary, so to say, to them, that's already released on GitHub. Mm -hmm. um, if I can tweet my use uh, to the, my home from an extra, mm -hmm. um, there are ways, I think they're called in the zone. I'm not sure if every country has that or just the Swedes, but if I turn something on, suddenly nothing happens. It's like it, it seems too chatty for all the devices. So basically, you're so the huh. protocol, so if I don't make it now, I will just retry later. Yeah. How would that work? Can so that would work. That would work. You can schedule. And basically, it's a, it's a queue. So it's an application queue. So if it becomes too chatty, it will just go on later. So basically, every every web request that has sent from here to here or from here to here basically has to be acknowledged on the other end. And that's the only case where this will actually say that, okay, I'll stop making the request. Okay. Let's so say you're starting 10,000 motors. You set a 10,000 deadline. Mm -hmm. And you get this effect for motors that power goes down and comes back up again. Can mm -hmm. you schedule you should be able to, that's not a problem, because with the scheduler, I actually, the yeah, yeah. So if you want to, I mean, then what we'll have to do in that case is that we will have to, since basically they can essentially talk to each other, even if I make a command that says that, you know, 10,000 motors switch on, on the gateway level, we'll be able to basically uh, stagger it such that it doesn't, because you're saying the starting current is higher, right? So, so to avoid that, that can be done. And that's one of the things that the device will declare over the web service, saying that, you know, I want a starting delay of these many seconds or something. So that's absolutely possible. 
So any other questions? You can play with it hopefully soon. You have the Pi? Okay. Actually, I'll quickly show you a demo of it running off the Pi. This is the actual application. You will see that these are the various devices that are connected with it. Which one? Oh, no, okay. This is the list of devices you can actually decide. So you can see that each device has some basic information. You can choose what type of device it is. So you'll see that right now we have only you know LEDs or lighting there, but like we can create different profiles and treat them in different ways. So there's a device code, there is status, there is action. So if I want to actually do something about it, so there is some lamp category as well. So this command base URL, model, line voltage, current power, so these are just additional fields and depending on what type of device it is, you could have different kinds of fields. That's just for a management perspective. So you can group into different parts. You will see different groups here. You can map it. And with a profile, this is basically showing the schedules that have been kind of done with the device. So same thing with groups, you can, groups are basically just, you're just grouping them into various places. So this is showing the existing groups and just saying that this device belongs to all these groups. And I can also set access levels, so I can say that the manager can manage this device specifically. And I can also do, I mean, uh, sorry, manage this group specifically. So manufacturers is pretty basic. You're just basically creating manufacturers and associ uh, associating lights with them. So that's more of a database than any cool thing. You can. If I select manufacturers. It will. It will. Yeah. Control. Yeah. So right now we don't have a case like that, but that's just. No. Easy to do. That's not a big deal. So may maybe not a case for a company that they take care of this protocol. Yeah, because for a home user, right. You see the manufacturer name, but I don't then you don't know what the protocol is. It could auto select it. It's just about having an internal database that knows the relation. So as long as that's there, that's not a problem. This has, so I actually visited the client around December. So, and the work started probably two months after that. So, February, March, first week. Yeah, so, the good thing was that we had the older system to look at. Yeah. So, not to actually play around with it, but we had screenshots and we had a decent idea of uh, what they wanted to do with it. Yeah. But uh, the. Uh, Uh, well, on the web side of it, on this side of it, it was three guys. And on the hardware side of it, we had a people of two people working on the actual hardware. Yeah. So, around five people, yeah. Ten yeah, yeah, approximately. Yeah. Yeah. Because from an architecture perspective, uh, the key things to figure out were that we didn't want to be in a situation where we have to change things later because a lot of this is our IP, so to say. Uh, so basically, that was the deal we had with the client. So we had to build that from a perspective that we could scale this to different things later. So basically the decision to have uh, JSON throughout, so right from uh, your mobile application or web application to the actual end device, the transport is, I mean the uh, format is always JSON. So it basically in some cases, the lower devices don't support JSON. So either at the uh, access, I mean the server level or at the gateway level we are converting it. So that what happens is that irrespective of what the device is, 
we can keep one sta standard format of communicating. So there was a lot of architecture that went into it and that has been in you know our heads for a while. So it was just about getting the right opportunity to use it. So that we didn't need to think of from ground up, but yeah, I mean, and as I said, having the billion system to look at and know what the client wanted, that was a big help because they gave it to us. I mean, we were playing it with it, tri with it remotely. So they had a LED connected and they were letting us play with it on the single device, of course, but that was good enough to at least start. All right, so that's about it. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.